Hey guys, welcome back. So for today's video, I wanted to go over the liquid cooling system that I'm developing for the one wheel platform. This is something that I've been thinking about really ever since I began making upgrades three years ago. Uh, the first time I took apart my, uh, my first XR, I noticed that the axle was hollow. And uh, though my riding style isn't uh, one that would build up a lot of motor heat, I recognized that motor heat was gonna be an issue. So it's something that I've been thinking about for quite some time. And then uh, when the GT platform was released, after a while, people started pushing the GT harder and harder and thermal shutdown became an issue. Well, at that time, both myself and a couple of other people recognized that uh, the heat can be mitigated in one primary uh, low hanging fruit, easy to address area. So I wanna go into the way the motor produces heat and ways of mitigating that so you can get a better understanding of where we're headed, why we're going the direction we are. In the one wheel platform, you've got the wheel itself, which is the electric motor. Now, the wheel is comprised of the tire, the rim, and the stator assembly. So you've got the tire that's driven by the wheel. The wheel is the, the moving outer portion of the electric motor itself. So as you can see by this component, this is the stator you'll notice this is also the axle. Well, the axle clamps to the frame rails and it sits still, and these are the field windings for the motor. Those windings sit still on the axle. As the electric pulses move around the windings, it drives the wheel. There are magnets epoxy to the inside of the wheel, and the wheel itself is the outer half of the electric motor. As a side note, this is why wheels are expensive to purchase, because it's not just an aluminum rim. It's an aluminum rim with a steel back iron and magnets epoxy to it because you're purchasing essentially half of the motor itself. All electric motors will build up some heat. Most electric motors are an in-runner motor, which means the field windings are the outer casing or outer housing of the motor and the, uh, the magnets are mounted to the armature that spins the shaft. A one wheel motor is completely opposite. The shaft does not spin and the windings, the field windings are mounted to the axle itself and it rotates the magnets around the outer shell. It, technically it's called an orbital or an outrunner motor. Guys that are into uh, radio controlled drones understand that terminology. When these motors run, you've got the field windings that are located here radially around the axle. The heat is generated in that copper wire. The copper wire heat builds up and transmits that heat into the, the steel laminations. Those steel laminations are a press fit to the aluminum axle. So the heat flows from the, the copper windings into the steel laminations and into the aluminum axle. The best method for pulling heat out of the motor from a production standpoint uh, so therefore the easiest way to mitigate this is by pulling heat out of the axle by way of clamping axle carriers. It is a, a wraparound clamping design that rather than just screw to the sides of the axle, it wraps around the axle and clamps to the axle itself. You can see here on this wheel, I've got an axle carrier installed. So as the motor generates heat, the heat in the windings goes to the steel laminations and to the axle, and the heat flow goes through the axle. So if you, if you wrap axle carriers around the axle, like such, it will, uh, the, the surface area of wrapping that carrier around the axle pulls heat out of the axle and into the axle carrier, and then we've got fins on the axle carrier to shed that heat. Some of the heat also gets shed through the frame rails. This is part of the reason that we have our opened bridge truss design for our rails is it does allow air to flow to the carriers. Also, the fins that we have on our wheels act as a fan. As the wheel rotates, it throws air There is a, a major bottleneck in the system. That bottleneck is the wall thickness of the axle right at this point. So you have the axle carrier here and aluminum flows heat well from the, the windings 
to the axle carrier, but you still do have this, this distance between the axle carrier and the windings. So you've got this, this thin wall thickness here, and that can only flow just so much heat in the same way that a hose, the diameter of a hose can only flow a certain amount of fluid. Uh, at the bearing juncture, you've got where the bearing mounts over the axle, you have a rubber O-ring that sits in a machined groove. That machined groove narrows the axle even thinner at that point. So there's an extreme bottleneck where the heat really can't flow all that well from the stator itself into the axle and into the carrier. And on top of all of that, you have distance. We began looking at this and realizing that we really need to, to pull heat from the core of the stator directly out. So what we came up with was a way to pull heat directly from the core of the motor. And that is done by way of this liquid cool sleeve. Uh, this is a, uh, a sleeve that we, it's something that I, I've been thinking about for a couple of years. And um, it has the same sort of hourglass profile that we have at the end of the axle. And it slides into the axle. So you've got the, the hollow in the wheel there. And this liquid cooling sleeve slides right into that hollow and goes very deep. In fact, I'll grab by the end of the lines so you can see that's the total depth that it goes into the axle. So this is about the depth at which the liquid cooling sleeve sits inside the axle. So you can see that directly beneath this stator uh, lamination stack is where the liquid cooling sleeve would sit. Rather than heat having to flow all the way from the windings to the laminations, all the way out the axle to the axle carrier, we're able to pull heat directly from the center of the axle. The heat flow is very, very short, and there are many aluminum webs that go from this area to flow heat to the core of the axle. So what I'd like to show you next is how, how we get the water into the axle, into the sleeve, uh, and then back out again. We already manufacture our ice block axle carriers. This axle carrier goes on the non-motor wire side. This axle carrier goes on the motor wire side. And that allows an area for the motor wire to exit through that slot. I began to realize, well, wait a minute here, that's gonna work well for our liquid cooling system because now you can feed the cooling sleeve into the axle and the exit of the hoses can go right through this motor wire slot in the axle carrier. So there you go. And the mount plate goes over the top there and the, the cooling hoses exit in the same way that the motor wire exits on the other side. Now you not only have the cooling ability of the, the finned axle carriers clamping around the axle, but then you have cool water being fed through this sleeve into the axle itself. We found that you can use simple dielectric grease around the, uh, the cooling sleeve when it's slid into the axle to conduct the heat from the windings into that, that liquid cooling sleeve efficiently. Part of the difficulty of the design of this uh, was to uh, to make this sleeve in a way that was not, uh, we didn't want it just hollow. So internally in this sleeve, we use a proprietary method to bore the inside out and allow cooling water or coolant to flow through the sleeve in a circular manner to maximize the amount of surface area inside the sleeve and to flow all the way around it so we don't have uh, water just pooling. There's not just a, an in and an out and it's hollow. There's actually a, a path, a water flow path through the sleeve to maximize heat transfer between the axle itself and the cooling fluid. The hoses that we're using, these are our simple silicone hoses that are designed for the radio control uh, nitro industry for radio control airplanes or RC cars for fuel delivery. They're impervious to chemical uh, interaction and uh, to various coolants. We were looking at, do you use distilled water? You don't wanna use tap water because the inside of an aluminum, uh, the aluminum cooling sleeve can corrode from the impurities in the water. 
So distilled water works fine, but in cold climates, you don't want the thing to freeze. So Dex Cool, we found works wonderfully. And so that's something that we'll be specking with the kit. We were looking at various pump styles or methods of moving the fluid around the system. Actually, not very much, uh, not a very high flow rate is required in order for this thing to, to cool uh, effectively. I've had uh, several people ask me about peristaltic pumps that would take the rotation of the wheel and push fluid. It's something that I looked at. There's a number of, there are benefits to it, but there are a number of drawbacks, not the least of which is there are various wheel options out there and trying to get a peristaltic pump to work with various wheels would be difficult. Also, the axle carriers wrap around the axle and that superintends some of that, that room that we would have for a peristaltic pump. I even looked at uh, what I would consider a G-force pump. As the board's bouncing, maybe a lever, a lever would move up and down and pump a piston pump to move water through the system. However, that wouldn't work for street riders that are just riding up steep hills. So I looked at a lot of things and I wanted to stay away from an electric pump for simplicity reasons. However, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that an electric pump really is the best way to go. This happens to be one particular pump that we've located. There are several options out there. There are various pump styles. There are vein style pumps. Uh, there are normal impeller pumps. Uh, this happens to be a diaphragm pump. I believe di a diaphragm pump is what we're gonna go with. And the primary reason for that is that all liquid cooling systems have to contend with uh, air in the system, uh, air bubbles and bleeding that air through the system. And with a normal vein style or impeller style pump, if you have uh, air in the pump itself, it will just cavitate in that air and it won't move fluid. Whereas a diaphragm pump, it's pumping a diaphragm back and forth. It will move either water or air. So a diaphragm pump, can it's a self-priming pump. And therefore, when you install the system, you can turn the pump on and it's automatically going to pull air and or water through the system, which will purge into the reservoir. Also, what we found is in, in pump testing, this particular pump, and there's one that's about half this size that we've been testing as well, they use very little power, very, very little power. In fact, we, they can be run on less than one watt of power. One 18650 cell will run this particular pump for six hours at a flow rate that exceeds what would be needed to properly cool the motor. For now, anyway, we're, we are looking at offering the kit with a single receptacle for a 650 cell, an electric pump, hoses, the, uh, the axle liquid cooling sleeve, as well as the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger is the one item that I don't have present here today because it's still in the design stage but I can explain to you what we're gonna do there. We began looking at various uh, methods of extracting the heat out of the, the water or out of the coolant once that heat has been transmitted through the axle sleeve and into the coolant. The system functions differently than say an automotive liquid cooling system for the engine. We don't really have thermal expansion to deal with or, or not much anyway, very, very little thermal expansion compared to a system that would operate above the boiling point. Therefore, we don't need a separate radiator and a reservoir and a pressurized system. What we're gonna go with is merely a single heat exchanger that will function as the reservoir for the coolant as well as the, uh, the radiator itself. The current design that we're looking at would mount to the front fender delete and it would have the same general size and maybe a, a similar profile as this uh, half fender. Now this is a carbon fiber piece. What we would be manufacturing for the heat exchanger would be aluminum and it would have some shallow fins on the face of it, but it would be roughly this size. We could also have one in the front and the rear if we really want to increase the cooling capacity of the system. Just the presence of the volume of water flowing into the motor and back out is enough to pull a tremendous amount of heat out of the motor itself. So the, the heat exchanger doesn't really have to do a huge amount. When looking at what to do in regards to the, the heat exchanger slash cooling reservoir, there were too many restrictions that forced people into our product ecosystem alone, and I wanted to avoid that. One of the things that I've been focusing on over the last probably 18 months or so is making sure that our products are 
are cross compatible with, with other uh, manufacturers in the industry. This has been one of the most challenging products that we have ever developed. And much of that is because the number of details that need to be thought through. The one wheel platform, ha it has fender deletes, it has foot pads, it has rails, it has axle carriers. These are things that we can update it, because it was designed for those, those items, those products. When you introduce a completely new system within a pre-existing system, it's much more difficult. I'm an efficiency nut, and as motors heat up, that added heat decreases efficiency. So even if you have a board that you're not really worried about it thermally and shutting down, you, you don't have you know, thermal problems with your board, running the motor at a cooler temperature will make the board run more efficiently. The motor will be more efficient. There's less internal resistance of the windings because they're running cooler. And so the system has benefits to it beyond just preventing thermal overload for people that heavy riders that are riding hard off-road and climbing hills. I find it fascinating. We're pushing for more and more performance out of these boards, especially in the VESC community. They're pushing these boards so hard to the point where now there are guys that are thermaling and shutting their boards down within five, six minutes of riding. It's more important now than it's ever been to get that heat out of the board, out of the motor, shed it into the air, and keep the motor nice and cool so you can keep on riding. I think that's it for today. There's uh, a lot to digest, I'm sure, and I'm sure I'll have a lot of questions in the comments section, but go ahead and ask me whatever you'd like. Feel free to give me ideas. I'm not closed off. If, if you have ideas for different pumping methods or just anything, please let me know. I am super excited to get this released for the next racing season. Thanks guys.